Isotope geochemistry has basically revolutionized uh, the study of Earth's past climates and many other things. I think many of you are probably already aware of how uh, isotope uh, work. Essentially you have uh, the number of protons defining elements and substances uh, like carbon. It's got six protons but it also has six neutrons so that's what gives us C12 and similarly oxygen has eight plus eight, uh, nitrogen has seven plus seven and so on. But uh, number of neutrons, uh, number of protons decides the number of electrons uh, for uh, neutrality. Then when you have oxidation states and redox states, you obviously have different level of, uh, different number of uh, electrons. So you have reduced carbon, uh, oxidized carbon, CO2, CH2O, and so on and so forth. Uh, but we know that sometimes uh, the elements can have the same number of protons but different number of neutrons which gives us uh, isotopes uh, and some of the isotopes are actually radioactive which means they begin to decay over time. How does that work? Uh, in case you are not already uh, exposed to this at some time in your education, you are looking here at uh, a, a substance which has got uh, the isotope as parent isotope remaining, so it's starting at 100%. Uh, if the isotope is radioactive, then obviously it's going from one form to another, so it has a daughter isotope. So the parent isotopes begins to decay and number of daughter isotopes begin to increase. So the time over which uh, it goes from 100% to 50% is called half-life and that allows us to use knowing the original concentration and the concentration of the parent and daughter isotopes that remain that allows us to figure out the the time or the age of any particular thing. We will see what we mean by that. So here we have a curve that's going from 100% to 50% in one half-life to 25% in uh, two half-lives and down to 12.5% in three half-lives and so on. So that becomes very useful then to take a substance like uh, carbon hydrocarbon from the past and look at some carbon isotope uh, which uh, we know from uh, our uh, chemistry what its original concentration would have been in terms of parent and daughter and then looking at the depletion or the remaining parent versus daughter isotope we can say how old so that's called carbon dating for example in the case we use carbon but this also works for lead and uh, um, uranium, thorium, various other things which have very long half-life half, uh, uh, and that allows us to go and tell how old uh, Earth is. For example, you find the oldest rocks and then you date them using these isotope um, chemistry methods and say uh, how old Earth is. And then you have to use other techniques like magnetic lines to say how continents have moved. For example, when we say India moved from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere, you not only have to say when it happened, which means you have to date it back to let's say 70 million years ago, but you have to also say where it was 70 million years ago. For that we use magnetic lines which I won't get into here. Nonetheless, all that story basically boils down to defining something called a delta where you typically have a standard for the particular isotope like let's say uh, C13 or oxygen 18 and so on and then you, are, you have a sample that you're trying to figure out how old it is or where it came from and this is the formula you would use 1 minus R sample divided by R standard times thousand because these are typically very small numbers so instead of parts per hundred which is percent we use parts per thousand so you put two zeros in the uh, below the slash here percent would be zero zero this is zero and double zero so it's parts per mil M-I-L or M-I-L-L-E -L -L -E. that's how uh, we do it looking at an example would make it very clear biology for example basically fractionates which means carbon has naturally occurring isotopes of C12 so six protons six neutrons and C13 
where you have six protons, so it's still carbon, but you have seven neutrons. It also has a radioactive uh, isotope called C14, which has six protons plus eight neutrons, so that is continuously generated in the atmosphere by cosmic rays bombarding nitrogen and taking off one of the protons to neutrons, so N7 plus 7 goes to C6 plus 8, so becomes C14. It's unstable, so continuously decays. So it's constantly being produced in the atmosphere, being taken up by photosynthesis, and as uh, the hydrocarbon gets buried, for example, as fossil fuel, it's not seeing the C14 uh, being taken up anymore, so it's going to just keep decaying in the hydrocarbon. So then you can go back and look at how much C14 is left, and then say when it was formed, and so on. Okay? I'll show example. So what else happens? When photosynthesis happens, C13 and C12 are being taken up, but uh, C12 is energetically easier to take up, so more C12 typically gets taken up, which means organic carbon is uh, has a deficit in C13 because it's much more fractionated into C12. So if you look at CH CH2, O carbohydrate sugar molecule that we talked about, it has C12 and C13, but how much of the C12 and C13 gets take up, taken up depends on how much CO2 is available. It's, if CO2 drops to a certain level, then photosynthesis will take up C13 to make up, but if there is abundant CO2 available, it prefers to take up C12. Okay, very simple. Listen to it again, make sure you understood it. Here is a very good example. For example, the Charles Keeling uh, CO2 measurement from Mauna Loa and from the South Pole observations both show the increasing concentrations over the uh, uh, global northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere from 1950s onwards. Uh, the northern hemisphere shows the seasonal cycle of the photosynthesis uh, increasing during spring summer time and decreasing during fall winter time and so on but the the increase in concentration is related to human activities how do we know that we can look at the reduction in oxygen from cape grim and the other station here alt which uh yeah alberta canada there it is alert canada sorry um so we are burning fossil fuel and we are using up oxygen don't worry, there's plenty of oxygen. But we are doing something else. If you measure the C13 to C12 ratio in the atmosphere over this period, you can see that both at Mauna Loa and the South uh, Pole Station, you have decreasing uh, C13, uh, delta C13. By definition, this is the delta C13, uh, which means the carbon we are producing is now depleted in C13 because it's old hydrocarbon and photosynthesized organic carbon is depleted in organic carbon. So when we bury, burn organic carbon, excess uh, CO2 that's produced is going to be from organic carbon that's depleted in uh, C13. So naturally occurring C13, C12 ratio would be something that is related to current photosynthetic rates and ocean exchanges, etc. But because we are burning this CO2 uh, from the hydrocarbon, because we are burning hydrocarbon releasing this CO2, we can clearly show that the C13 is decreasing. So this is a cute way in which we can use the isotopes. Um, the other example I'll include here is the Delta O18, which we have already shown a few times without explaining. Again, Delta O18, parts per thousand. What happens? Uh, H2O has uh, O18 and O16. There is also an O17 which people are now using, but let's stick to O18 and O16. Uh, By the way, the fraction of uh, C13 and C12 are minute compared to C12, which is majority of it. I think it's 97 plus 2 plus less than 1 or so. In this case, it's uh, 99 point something and then remaining uh, O2, but you please check the numbers. Nonetheless, um, current ocean is uh, set at a depletion of zero, which means it's the standard in some ways. There is a standard seawater as well with which these are measured. Nonetheless, what happens? When evaporation happens, 
it's easier to pick up O16 because it's lighter so the evaporated water in the atmosphere has much more O16 than O18 this is the water that's being transported on average towards the poles because the energy transport required to make up for the energy surplus in the tropics, energy deficit in the high latitudes. Remember the sphere, more energy received, less energy received, more energy lost in the high latitudes than in low latitudes. All those good things give us <coughs> this meridional transport uh, in a zonal mean sense, so if you average over all longitudes and look at the meridional section from the equator towards the poles, you have O16 enriched water vapor and as it rains along the way more of the O18 falls down because it's heavier so the ocean is going to get depleted in O18 values as it transports uh, more of the uh, O16 and receives um, the precipitation that is depleted in O18 because it's coming from uh, evaporation in the lower re lower latitudes. So you already have a deficit O delta O18 here by about 10 parts per mil. And as you go towards the polar latitudes and you start snowing and forming glaciers on land you're going to have more and more depleted O18 depleted water being locked up okay so there is a net transport of water and there is a net depletion of O18 as you go towards the poles because less O18 is picked up some of the O18 is dropped along the way and deficit O18 is being locked up okay which also means that the more and more glaciers you build here more and more evaporation is being locked up on land so you're going to leave behind um, less and less O18 right so O18 is going to be uh, depleted here and is going to be uh, enriched here so you can use both of these to look at the O18 and O16 ideas here is a figure from Bill Ruddiman's book so you are looking here at deep water delta O18 values in parts per mil so when you have early phase and cooling uh, deep water is depleted in O18 because it's been uh, locked up onto uh, glaciers and then when you have uh, ice sheet growth and greater than 7 degrees C additional cooling um, so this is warmer here this is colder and colder so you are going to have um, ice sheet that is going to be um, sorry deep water that's going to be um, getting richer and richer in Delta O18 because more of the O16 is getting locked up in the glaciers okay more and more depleted in O18 which means O18 is left behind so the deep water is getting enriched in O18 as you get uh, ice sheet growth and cooling uh, whereas you have warmer temperatures and less glaciers means um, depleted O18 okay so I hope I explained it properly but make sure you understood it the other way that we use it very quickly is that OC14 that's formed in the atmosphere is being taken up in the ocean and when the ocean water sinks in regions like the North Atlantic uh, you remember the thermohaline circulation you can look up my podcast in the other courses uh, water sinks in places like the North Atlantic and the Southern Ocean that water inundates the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean so C14 formed in the atmosphere as soon as it gets away from the atmosphere into the ocean begins to decay and the further it goes away from the surface when it's sinking the more depleted it gets in C14 because over time it's losing C14 and becoming uh, back into C12 uh, and C13 um, so you have depleted C14 in the waters here compared to here so this is a newer water this is older water so this C14 can be used to age the deep waters because the C14 is a tracer and how long this can be used for dating depends on the half-life so half-life of uh, 
the C14 is I think something like 5750 years look it up please so it allows us to wa date back to about 50,000 years because beyond that it's not very useful right so that's how the isotopes work we're gonna put this story together and look at how past CO2 can be reconstructed using all these isotopic evidences. But geochemistry, isotopic geochemistry is a very powerful tool that's now used more and more for understanding so many things about past climate and past geology.